I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me and for giving, assigning me the uh, topic with, that is the correct answer, the novel agents, it makes it a little bit easier. But no, I'm, I'm going to uh, argue in favor of the novel agents, uh, knowing full well that all of these treatment um, agents, all these modalities do play a role in these highest risk patients. All right, here are my disclosures. So let's first think about the question posed to us. What's the optimal management of deletion 17P CLL, the highest risk patients uh, with this disease? Well, I think the optimal goal would be to cure these patients. All of us would like to, and you've heard different strategies, theories earlier on of how we might accomplish this. We do have to keep the caveat in mind that we're going to do this with manageable toxicity. Allo stem cell transplant certainly has the promise of curing CLL, but the reality is, unfortunately, allo transplants frequently don't cure CLL patients. These are the uh, overall survival curves uh, for allo transplants uh, in the United States as per the CIBMTR over about a decade. And you can see the median overall survival is measured in a few years. Possibly because of the limitations associated with allo transplant, the complications which we frequently see, including obviously infections, CLL patients have an underlying immunodeficiency associated with the disease present from diagnosis, interestingly enough, that worsens over time and certainly gets worse with chemotherapy. So the infectious complications relating to the non-relapse mortality certainly contribute to the relatively few transplants we perform every year in the country for CLL. The second point to keep in mind is this is a disease of older patients. The median age of diagnosis is somewhere in the realm of 71 years or so. Obviously, allo transplants are better tolerated by uh, younger patients, so the majority of CLL patients really aren't even a candidate for the procedure, unfortunately. Also, keep in mind who is most affected by deletion 17P, which CLL patients. It's the older patients who um, really have more heavily pretreated disease. Deletion 17P is only about 5% of diagnosis, but it's more than a third of the relapse refractory patients. So again, it really is a problem for the older, more heavily pretreated population. And all of these factors contribute, you can see, to really the minimal need in decreasing use of allo transplant for CLL over time. And with this in mind, you can see the rates have been decreasing since about 2010 as we started developing the novel agents. Okay, so we can't cure most of the deletion 17P patients, probably. What's the second best option? That's to improve survival. And as you saw from Jackie, I, I completely agree. We probably are improving the overall survival of deletion 17P patients with a brutinib. But the problem is we're, we're now learning is it's still far from optimal, uh, specifically a brutinib. This is the three-year follow-up from the 1102 data showing you that, let's see if I can use the pointer here, that the patients with deletion 17P treated with abrutinib continue to do worse compared to the lower risk patients. You can see they progress more quick, quickly. There's a continuous rate of relapse and a PFS in the roughly two year range. And even when you're treating more treatment naive patients, not so heavily pretreated patients, the deletion 17P patients continue to do worse. One of the reasons for this is the inability of abrutinib to induce deep remissions. Here you can see data from four clinical trials enrolled in deletion 17P patients. And as we can see, as again Jackie pointed out, the PFS numbers are much better than what we saw with chemoimmunotherapy. But unfortunately, there really still is a paucity of complete remissions. And if you were listening closely to the previous debate with uh, Rick and Matt, MRD, CR, deep remissions, it remains important, but we're still just learning how to better understand these endpoints, how to induce deep remissions with the novel agents. What we've also learned from watching patients progress on a brutinib over time are a few other uh, issues that begin to arise. 
in the Ohio State experience, Richter's transformation uh, can occur at not an insignificant rate. It's this curve in the middle here. And at about 12 months, the rate of Richter's was 5% and continued to increase over time. What may be more important, however, is this line here, which is largely toxicity. Not an insignificant number of patients come off of abrutinib because of side effects, unfortunately, especially the older patients. The, there was a presentation at ASH by uh, Anthony Mado who combined the experience from 10 centers in the US. And out of 131 patients who discontinued abrutinib, 50% discontinued because of side effects. And as you previously heard, this can include major bleeding. It can include atrial fibrillation. But what's probably more common are the persistent grade one and two side effects that patients can't tolerate over time, like diarrhea, arthralgias, rash. It may be these side effects that is most troublesome for some of the older patients. And lastly, the. The, the last limitation I'll mention of, of brutinib is the financial toxicity, obviously. This is perhaps a little less important than in the deletion 17P patients, given their life expectancy, but obviously something to keep in mind regarding chronic therapy. So I would conclude that brutinib and allo transplant are very much needed in the treatment of deletion 17P patients, but neither are really optimal in that we can need to continue making improvements. So what else do we have? This is a uh, list of the novel agents being studied in CLL. It's a partial list, largely because I ran out of room. There are a lot of things being looked at still in CLL. And especially for this high-risk patient population, we still have work to do. But we're really just gonna focus on the deletion 17P data sets here. And the first agent to mention is idelisib. This is a subset analysis from the randomized study leading to the approval of adelisib and rituximab. And if you focus on the blue curves, you can see that with pretty short follow-up, albeit, that uh, patients with deletion 17P appear to be responding just as well as the lower risk patients. However, you still see a rate of continuous relapse. We're approaching the median PFS in like a year and a half or so. Given that side effects as well, it's, it's hard to conclude that this agent is more optimal than a brutinib. Well, how about the PD-1 inhibitors? Obviously, they're taking over every other malignancy. Uh, this is a small clinical trial, an early report from the Mayo Clinic, looking at pembrolizumab in CLL and Richter's. Only 14 patients, but interestingly, three responses. What's kind of fascinating, though, is all three responses were in Richter's transformation. The other CLL patients didn't respond. So I think this is, this is um, something that certainly is worthy of further study. It's hard to conclude that Pembro is the, the answer for deletion 17P. Acalabrutinib, on the other hand, may very well be an improvement over abrutinib. It's hard to tell with such short follow-up, but this is an orally administered uh, specific BTK inhibitor that, again, may very well be better given this very pro provocative uh, PFS curve, as you can see. 61 relapsed refractory patients, a third of which had deletion 17P. Interestingly, all of those patients responded, 100% response rate in the high-risk patients. Additionally, there appears to be less toxicity there have not been reports of major bleeds or AFib so far. And interestingly, at one year of follow-up, no Richter's transformation in this patient population. So I think some of these points differentiate this from the experience uh, with abrutinib, but again, more follow-up is needed, certainly. I think the agent we really need to focus on the most regarding these high-risk patients is venetoclax, an orally administered BCL2 inhibitor directly inducing apoptosis independent of TP53, making it an obvious possibility for this patient population. And just to remind you, the, the recently published phase one demonstrated a 79% response rate in the relapse refractory patients. Well, here we do have a dedicated phase two study enrolling only ultra high risk patients. All of these patients had deletion 17P. 
And, uh, and, and just to remind you, early on, we did see tumor lysis with this agent. With the five-week dose ramp up, as well as other prophylactic measures, this has largely been mitigated. So of the 107 or so patients enrolled to this clinical trial, you can see the response rate was identical to the relapse refractory patients, 79%. And interestingly, we're starting to see deeper remissions. It's at a, it's at a fairly low level with only about 11, 12 months of follow-up. But nonetheless, we are starting to see CRs in, with this single agent. Here you can see the duration of response and PFS curves from the trial. And I'll point to the PS cur PFS curve here. The 12-month estimate was 72% PFS, 87% OS. And to me, this looks pretty comparable to a brutinib comparing across clinical trials. So, you know, in terms of PFS, it looks somewhat similar. But again, I think the difference really is in the deep remissions. As the responses are evolving over time, you can see an increasing rate of CRs. And interestingly, some of these patients are attaining MRD negativity. Of the 45 patients tested, 18 were MRD negative. Well, what can we expect with further follow-up? Uh, what can we expect from these responses over time and as we start to develop some of the novel combinations? Well, here we do have a data set, uh, venetoclax and rituximab with two-year follow-up recently presented as well. And as you can see, half of the patients are in CR. And interestingly, the same percentage of deletion 17P patients have achieved CR as well. Again, differentiating this drug from the kinase inhibitors. Equally as interesting, more than half of the patients tested are MRD negative. So we're seeing half of the patients attaining CR, half of those tested are MRD negative. So obviously very provocative results. And not surprisingly, those who are MRD negative appear to do exceptionally well over time. So lastly, uh, Matt already made this point, but I do think it bears repeating. This may be the biggest differentiator from the kinase inhibitors, and that's the durability of the responses. Again, these were 11 patients who stopped therapy. Two had asymptomatic progression. They became MRD positive. One went back on venetoclax, but nine remain in remission with a median of 16 months off of therapy. So obviously this We'll, we'll have to see what, uh, how this bears with time, but uh, it certainly is very provocative. So in conclusion, we do have better agents for treating deletion 17P. Again, going back, first-line FCR provided a, a median PFS of 11 months. We now have a brutinib. Uh, we, we, we still perform stem cell transplantation on unique patients, um, but these agents really are still less than optimal. And with some of the newer agents, a calibrutinib, for example, may be an improvement over a brutinib. But today, venetoclax is the most optimal therapeutic for CLL patients uh, who have high-risk disease, given the depth of response, the durability of these responses, potentially one day allowing us to stop treatment. So I'll leave you with one final thought, and that is that I think future advances really will come from the novel combinations of these agents as we try to induce deeper emissions in the deletion 17P patients using a defined or limited period of treatment. Thanks.